Luke chapter 6, build on the rock. Um, Luke chapter 6, let's read verse 46 to 49. Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and <coughs> laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and couldn't shake it, for it was founded on the rock. He who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So we're continuing our study through the Gospel of Luke, and currently we're making our way through a sermon that he preached called the Sermon on the Plain. And in this sermon, he shares the Beatitudes with us, which are the blessed are you sayings of Jesus. And so far, we've looked at God's blessing upon the poor, his blessing upon those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, his blessing upon those who uh, weep over their own sin and the sin in our world. We looked at his blessing upon those who are persecuted. Um, his blessing upon those of us who love our enemies. And we saw what Jesus tells us about judging others. Judge not. Last week we asked the question, how are you known? And through the illustration Jesus gave of a tree bearing fruit, we saw that some are known by their good works. Uh, others are known by their bad works, but we are all known to God by what's in our hearts. So today we're going to look at what Jesus told us about building our lives on the rock, which of course is himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, I've got a song in my mind just, uh, I've had this week uh, from when I was a kid, uh, you know, the, the wise man builds his house upon the rock. I promise Jerry I wouldn't sing it, but uh, I... <laughs> <laughs> it is a, it's a great song if you haven't heard it I'm sure everybody has heard it but if you haven't look it up online great song build your house on the rock so the first thing is um, to, to build on the rock to build on Jesus we, we must come to Jesus come to Jesus verse 46 why do you call me Lord Lord and not do the things which I say whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them I will show you who he is like uh, one of the things people will often say about a person who comes to Jesus is that they, they had a, a come-to-Jesus moment. Uh, and when they say this, it's usually not meant as a compliment. Um, instead, it's meant as an insult, you know, something that's said to make fun of them or to shame them. But when a person truly comes to Jesus, then they won't be bothered by comments like that because Jesus becomes more than just a name to them. Jesus becomes their Lord and Savior. And by coming to him, that person is surrendering themselves to him, surrendering themselves to his will for their life. And some people hear the word surrender and they think of it as a bad thing. You know, I've got to, I've got to get up all these things for Jesus and I, I don't want to do that. It's asking too much. But let me tell you something. Coming to Jesus is the best decision a person will ever make. You ask any person who is a Christian what the best decision they've ever made is, and they'll tell you coming to Jesus. Listen to what Jesus says about those who come to him. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Um, this is one, pas one, one passage that's among my favorite um, verses in the Bible. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, your burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So you see, when a person comes to Jesus for the first time, they're coming to him with the, the burden of sin, all its pain, all of its suffering, coming with that weight on their backs, that burden on their backs. And it's too much for a person to bear on their own. Um, this is shown to us in Psalm 32. 
And King David wrote about the burden of sin he felt uh, on several occasions where, where he sinned. Psalm 32, verse 1 to 5. Um, Psalm 32, verse 1 to 5. He says, uh, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old, through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer, Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah, which means think on this. As you can see, the, the burden of sin that David felt was too much for him to bear on his own. And so he brought it to God, and he uh, happily and confidently proclaims, You forgave the iniquity of my sin. And that's why Jesus came into the world, to take the burden of sin from us, to bear it himself on the cross as he died for the sin of the world. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, He hath made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 1 Peter chapter 2 Verse 24 says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. So when we come to Jesus, Jesus takes away the burden of sin, weighing us down, crushing us. But even more than that, he gives us rest. Spiritually speaking, he gives us rest. Rest from the yoke of religion, from performing good works and trying to earn our way to heaven or to, to keep our salvation. Rest from that. Trying to please God with our works, thinking that if we don't, he's going to angrily smash us with his mighty fist. He also gives us rest from going through overwhelming trials and tribulations on our own with, with no help from him. He gives us help and rest through that. We'll look more of that. We'll look more of that in the last point of the sermon. Ultimately, the rest will one day be complete and perfect. We spend eternity with Jesus in heaven and we'll be free from all the heaviness of the burdens of this life. So we come to Jesus, who is the rock of our salvation, and he frees us from all our burdens. But there's several other occasions in Scripture when Jesus invites us to come to him. John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And then in verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. John chapter 7, verse 37 to 38 is on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of flowing water, of living water. So in these verses, Jesus is inviting us to come to him, who is the bread of life, and we will never hunger again spiritually speaking about salvation and he invites us to come to him who is the fountain of life and receive the Holy Spirit who is the living water uh, and we will never spiritually thirst again because he quenches our thirst when we come to him for salvation so to to build our lives on the rock we must first come to him to our Lord Jesus Christ. The rock. Second, building on the rock, to build on the rock, we must hear and obey Jesus. Hear and obey Jesus. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 47. Wow. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you who he is like. It's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. 
When the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house. It couldn't shake it, for it was founded on the rock. During the, the Civil War, General Lee one day sent word to Stonewall Jackson that the next time he rode in the direction of the headquarters, the commander-in-chief would be glad to see him on a matter of no great importance. Well, General Jackson received the message and he immediately prepared to leave the next morning. Rising very early, he rode the eight miles to Lee's headquarters against a storm of wind and snow and arrived just as Lee was finishing breakfast. Much surprised, Lee inquired why Jackson had come through such a storm. General Jackson replied, you said that you wished to see me. Your wish is a supreme command to me. So I think that illustrates something important for us. Our supreme commander is the Lord Jesus Christ. He should be so much more important to us than General Lee was to Stonewall Jackson. And so when he tells us to do something, we must not only hear what he says, but we must obey him as well. And when we do, when we hear and obey, we're building on him, our rock. Oswald Chambers wrote, The Lord does not give me rules, but he makes his standard very clear. If my relationship to him is that of love, I will do what he says. If I hesitate, it is because I love someone I have placed in competition with him, namely, myself. And don't miss that last word there from, from Chambers' quote there, myself. Self is co in constant competition with Christ in our lives. But self is the wrong foundation to build our house upon because self will not stand up against the storms of this life and self is only going to let us down. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 27, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So Jesus tells us that if we want to come to him, we must first deny ourselves. We do that by taking up the cross, taking up our cross and following him. Taking up our cross isn't an easy thing to do because it involves denial of the things that our flesh desires. Christy Gambrell from the Gospel Coalition explains, Therefore, when Jesus calls for self-denial and cross-bearing, he's claiming authority. Following Christ means disowning the self and giving allegiance to him instead, and it means giving him allegiance down to the very depths of our being. So Jesus calls us to an entire way of life, a complete surrender. He calls us to be willing to follow him no matter what the cost is. David Platt says we should ask the following questions to see if we are ready to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your closest friends? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means alienation from your family? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your reputation? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your job? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your life? So those are all great questions to ask yourself. But brothers and sisters, denying ourselves and taking up our cross isn't something that can be done without love. So when we hear his voice and we obey him, we deny ourselves and take up our cross, we're doing it with love for him, and we love him because he first loved us. John chapter 14, verse 21 says, Whoever has my commands and obeys them, 
He is the one who loves me. And that's something that the world does not understand um, about, the, about the Christian's relationship with God. The world thinks of God's commandments as a bad thing. You must do this or else. And there are those people who try to follow God's commandments, but they only do it because they're afraid of God's wrath. But for the Christian, for the one who is building his or her life upon the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, we hear and we obey our Lord Jesus because we love him. He is our everything, and he deserves everything from us. R.C. Sproul says, interestingly, in the New Testament, the verb to obey comes from the same Greek root as the word to hear. Akuin means to hear. We put a prefix on it, hyperkuin, and it means to obey. So literally, to obey means hyperhearing, or really hearing. Jesus doesn't want people just to hear his voice. He wants them to do the things that they hear. Amen. Amen. Really hearing what he says, doing what he says. Now, there is a biblical example given by Jesus in the parable of the talents. Found in Matthew chapter 25, um, verse 14 to 30. Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. And he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. Likewise, he who had received two gained two more also, when he who had received one went and dug it um, in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. When he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. And I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. And look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. His Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, gather where I haven't scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to him who has ten talents. But to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, in this parable, two of the three servants hear the master, when he gives them the talents and he leaves, and in order to please him when he comes back, they invest the money so they'll have more to give back to him. That's probably something he taught them to do, and I believe he commanded them to do it. So by investing it and returning more to him, they were being obedient to him. But the third servant, he did not invest the money. Instead, he hid it, and his reason was because he was afraid of the master. So he tried to please the master by giving him back the money, but in his fear, he had hidden it instead of investing it. And by in, in doing so, he was disobedient. And because of that, he was judged for his sin. So 
brothers and sisters, when it comes to building on Christ our rock, it's not enough for us to just hear his words. You know, we can come here to church every Sunday for the rest of our lives and we can hear the sermons. We can hear God's word, but that wouldn't be enough to get us into heaven. When we hear, we respond in obedience to him, putting our faith and trust in him alone and coming to him, not in fear, but coming to him with hearts full of love for him who loves us and gave himself for us on the cross. Mm -hmm. Lastly, building on the rock. We must stand firm in Jesus. Stand firm, stand strong in Jesus. Verse 48 of Luke chapter 6. Verse 48 says, He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and couldn't shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Yes. When I lived in Colorado, my family lived in a trailer park. And when my brother uh, Stephen and I got bored, we'd go outside and we'd look for things to do. Well, the gentleman who owned the trailer park had a bunch of pallets that were... Uh, stacked up on the other side of the trailer park and so Stephen and I we decided that we were going to go build forts out of these pallets so we dragged the pallets across the yard into the woods where we used to play and uh, we didn't have nails and screws so basically we, we laid the pallets up against the trees we put a pallet on the ground and laid up two sides on it and then put a, a piece of plywood uh, across the top so these were our forts and we had a lot of fun playing around with them, and to us, you know, they looked strong, looked like they could hold up against the weather, and we were so confident in this that we would we'd sit down in them, and we'd bring things into them to uh, decorate and to play with, because um, we thought these forts were, were great. But since we, since we didn't nail or screw them together, the walls obviously were not stable, and when it rained and the wind blew, our forts, of course, fell over, and they couldn't stand firm didn't stand strong because they did not have a solid foundation. They didn't have anything holding them together. When it comes to building our life on the rock, Jesus Christ, we must stand firm in Jesus because he is the rock that is strong and secure and unmovable. And he explains this by giving us the illustration of two men building a house. One builds his foundation on a rock, and the other on the sand. When the floods came, the house on the, on the rock stood unshaken and safe through the storm. Well, the house on the sand fell, and it was ruined. So Jesus is telling us that as Christians, we must also build our house upon the rock, our lives upon him, the rock, because we're going to go through a lot of storms in this life. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 3 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 to 11 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. John chapter 16 verse 33 Jesus said these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace in the world you will have tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world those are just a few of the references in scripture of the trials and tribulations that Christians will go through 
He doesn't hide it from us. He wants us to know that the Christian life isn't going to be easy. But when we build our life upon him, the rock, and we trust him through everything, through the good and bad, he will keep us close. He will not let us go. And he will welcome us into heaven when we take our last breath. Now, some Christians go through more troubles than others, like, like the Christians in other countries, uh, mm -hmm. like China and Iran, where you can be arrested and tortured and executed for your faith in Jesus. Others don't go through trials like that, but we do go through other trials. You know, we might lose our job or lose a family member, a close friend. We might have a serious health problem, just to give a few examples. Well, the Apostle Paul gives us a long list of the tribulations and persecutions that he went through during his ministry. Now this is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 29. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 29. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in death so often. From the Jews, five times I received forty stripes minus one, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, yeah. in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, and hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak when I am not weak, who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation. Well, that's uh, that's quite a long list. Yeah. Um, and the Apostle Paul was probably the greatest missionary the church has ever had. <coughs> but he was not he was not immune to those trials. And can you just imagine going through all of that? Well, we might not have to go through the things on that list, but none of us are immune to the struggles in this life. You know, we all go through trials and tribulations many times in our lives. And unfortunately, some people have not built their foundation on the rock, Jesus Christ. And without him, their foundation is like sand, and it will not hold up against the storms of this life. It will be washed away. Yeah. It's really hard to watch a person who does not have a relationship with Jesus go through suffering in this life because they don't have the hope and peace that's found in Christ the rock. Mm -hmm. And so their house gets swept away and as Jesus says the ruin of that house is great. It's a sad thing. We have the hope of Jesus Christ though. He is our strong foundation. And I love it. In closing, I'd like to ask you to take time in the week ahead to examine your heart and think about what foundation you've built your life upon. Yes. If you've built upon the solid right, excuse me, the solid rock, yes. the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will always stand strong and firm. Amen. Not because of your own strengths, but because of God and his love for you. And so when those trials come, and they will come, you can rest in Christ, knowing that he won't abandon you, and he will bring you through, whatever it is. Amen. But if you haven't given your life to Jesus, then you have a weak foundation, which is built on the sand, and it will not hold up against the trials of this life. Even the strongest of men and women can't make it through the trials of this life on their own. That's because of sin. It's because of the heavy burden sin has placed upon us. 
But God loved us so much and gave his only son. Who died on the cross for the sin of the world, so whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And he will be your foundation if you ask him to. He is the eternal foundation, the strongest foundation, the greatest foundation. And may we build our lives upon him. If, if you've never done that, or you know, if you've never given your life to Jesus, I encourage you to do so today. He loves you. He gave himself for you. He will give you salvation if you ask him to. If you turn to him, give your life to him, surrender to him, love him. Let us pray. We love you so much, Almighty God, and we thank you for your word. Thank you for being our foundation. God, that when we give our lives to you, immediately you, you become our foundation and we're able to build our lives on you. God, may we remember that. We go through different trials in this life and uh, face difficult circumstances. You're always with us. Can't thank you enough for that. Helps to be strong in you. And Lord, those around us who we see are being swept away because their foundation is not on you but in the sand and uh, on their way to ruin. Lord God, give us the boldness and the words to go to them and tell them about you, the love that you have for them, and the strong foundation that you offer to them. God, may we always love you and honor you with our lives. May we uh, faithfully serve you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.